Hello and welcome everybody. Thank you all for coming. I'm John Smalley and I'm a librarian with the San Francisco Public Library. And with me today is San Francisco author and poet Cesar Love, who will be discussing astrology, the San Francisco Giants, and his latest book, Baseball and Astrological Sightline. While we're waiting for everyone to join us, I want to take a moment to acknowledge our community and to tell you about a few of our upcoming programs. One moment. On behalf of the Public Library, we want to welcome you to the unceded land of the Ohlone tribal people and to acknowledge the many Ramatush Ohlone tribal groups and families as the rightful stewards of the lands on which we reside and work. Our library is committed to uplifting the names of these families and community members, and we encourage you to learn more about first person rights. San Francisco Public Library's Summer Stride Literacy Program began in June and will run through August. Summer Stride is the library's annual learning, reading, and exploration program for all ages and abilities. Join us for author talks, reading lists, book giveaways, nature experiences, and more. You can register today by visiting our website, sfpl.org. On Sunday, July 11th, SFPL is hosting the 40th Annual Northern California Book Awards. These awards recognize the best public works of 2021 by, I'm sorry, 2020 by Northern California authors. <laughs> On July 13th, author Jonathan Taplin and cultural critic Grau Marcus discuss Taplin's new book, The Magic Years, Scenes from a Rock and Roll Life. And on July 20th, Dr. Keisha Middlemass of Howard University and sociologist Reuben Jonathan Miller of the University of Chicago discuss the politics, race, and policies of incarceration and reentry. Lastly, on July 28th, please join us for a time travel journey to the mid century nightlife of San Francisco via the unique letter forms and designs of matchbooks and neon signs associated with legacy businesses. Uh, this ends the announcements part of the program. I would now like to introduce our featured author, Cesar Love. Cesar Love is a well-known San Francisco Latinx poet. He is the author of two books of poetry, While Be Sleep and Birthright. He is a co-editor of the Haight-Ashbury Literary Journal, and he is an astrologer and lifelong fan of the San Francisco Giants. Today, he'll be talking about the astrology of the San Francisco Giants and also his new book, Baseball and Astrological Sightline. Uh, at the end of Cesar's presentation, there'll be a brief Q&A. If at any point you have questions for the author, please put them in the chat and I will read them to him during the Q&A. Now, uh, let's please welcome Cesar Love. Take it away, Cesar. All right. Well, thank you, John. Um, thank you, Lisa of the Tech Crew. Uh, thank you, San Francisco Public Library. Thank you, Giants fans and anyone else who might be attendant and in attendance. And thank you most of all to the Ohlone people. I am going to share my screen here and bring up my PowerPoint. So this talk's called The Astrology of the San Francisco Giants, and it combines two seemingly different fields, astrology and baseball. I'm assuming that I do not need to explain a lot about baseball to the people here in attendance, but I'm also assuming that I may need to explain a certain amount about astrology to some of the audience here. This talk will get somewhat technical, so at the outset, I will explain some of the basics of astrology just to pave the way for what I'm going to say later, but it may not be clear to everyone here. So I will have time for questions at the end. If something doesn't make sense, please ask me about it at the end. Also, I'm going to make my email available. So if you don't have time to ask your questions to me today, um, you know, please email me. So about astrology. There's a chance you're only familiar with your sun sign. Say you know yourself to be an Aries or a Taurus. 
This means that on the day you were born, the sun was passing through the constellation of Aries or the constellation of Taurus. But there's a greater depth to this. On the same day you were born, there were other planets in the solar system that were passing through signs of the zodiac. And these also have an influence on your character. And these planets were in other constellations besides Aries or Taurus. You know, for example, your moon could have been in the sign of Libra or the sign of Scorpio, or Saturn could have been in the sign of Capricorn. So what I'm showing here is an astrological birth chart to just give a quick example. This is the birth chart of Inc. Aaron. And I want to show that, for example, here is his son. His son is located at 16 Aquarius. And here is his Saturn. It's located at 18 degrees Aquarius. And here's his moon sign. His moon is in the sign of Libra. And his Jupiter is here in Libra also. These planets are really close together. This is called a conjunction. These are planets that are holding their energy together and have a relationship where they're working together or working at cross purposes. And this is what's called the rising sign. It's the constellation that was on the Eastern horizon when someone was born. When Hank Aaron was born, the constellation on the Eastern horizon was the sign of Taurus. So rising sign is also called an ascendant. And the ascendant is the face that someone shows to the outer world, to the public. This is your public persona, how people perceive you and how you approach the world. It's not your internal life. This is not your inner life. Your inner life is determined by other factors of the chart, but your outer life, how you're perceived is your rising sign. There's also each sign of the zodiac has a planet that's considered its ruling planet that has a correspondence with it. And this planet has an affinity because it shares a similar energy to that sign. Let's say the planet, the sign of Aries has an affinity with the planet Mars because they share similar energy. Aries has that go for it quality, somewhat assertive jump into things. And the planet Mars has this energetic, assertive, drive force going forward. They're not the same, but they are similar and they're considered to have a correspondence and an affinity. <clears throat> Similarly, like the sign of Taurus has this sort of, you know, gentle kind of luxuriating quality to it. And the planet Venus has similar energy of just being refined, being nice, being pleasant. So so these are these are said to be somewhat in correspondence, somewhat in affinity. Um, I'm going to just do two more of these. Uh, the sign of Gemini has a correspondence with the planet Mercury. Uh, Gemini is a mental sign. Well, Geminis like to talk. They like to think things. They like to absorb information. Mercury is all about processing information, absorbing information, speaking, communicating. So the planet Mercury is an affinity with the sign of Gemini. Uh, the sign of Cancer. Uh, rules domesticity, the home life, the emotional, emotional centers. So does the moon. The moon is the planetary body that is in keeping with, with the sign of cancer because it rules emotions, homes, domesticity, mothers, nurturing qualities, things like that. So I'm going to talk about the correspondence between the signs of the zodiac, the, the ruling planets, and the positions of a baseball team. So the sign of Aries and the planet Mars correspond with the position of the short stop. A short stop requires quick bursts of energy, like the ram, it's a symbol of Aries, charges towards its target with its head and horns showing. So I think of the short stop when he feels the slow grounder, he must charge towards the ball unrestrained. I mean, this is Aries and Mars energy embodied in the short stop. Now, Taurus and the planet Venus are embodied in the center fielder. Taurus is the sign of plants and vegetation, and the center fielder stands in the middle of, of the field, the middle of the outfield with endless expanse of green to one's right and to one's left. It's like being in the middle of a nature preserve, that center field. That's the Taurus energy of vegetation. And I'm going to add center field has a special mystique for baseball fans. We put it on a pedestal above the other positions. Just think of the song, put me in coach, I'm ready to play center field. Well, this mystique of center field, it exists because the energy of Taurus is 
the one of all the signs, it's the one who has an energy closest to the sensibility of the game of baseball. Taurus is a spring sign and it's a life affirming sign, a sign of fertility. This is what baseball is about. We play baseball in spring to celebrate life and to celebrate fertility. These are the realms of Taurus and they're there in center field. Here's a picture of Willie Mays. I'm gonna talk about more later. I think that some I found this picture on the internet is colorized from the original. That's our hometown boy, center fielder, making his catch uh, in the 1954 World Series. Okay, to Gem sign of Gemini. Gemini and the planet Mercury correspond with a pitcher. Gemini is a mental sign. In battle, a Gemini's best weapon is his ability to outsmart an opponent. So the pitcher's in a mental battle as well as a physical battle with the batter. His intent is to outwit his opponent by throwing the ball by him with a variety of placements, speeds, and trajectories. This is Gemini and Mercury corresponding to the pitcher. Cancer and the moon um, bring you the catcher. The symbol for cancer is a crab. And the catcher wears a chest protector, shin guards, and a mask. This equipment is shell-like and reminiscent of a crab. So cancer, and cancer is a sign of home and the catcher's roost is home plate. Cancer is also the sign of mothers and nurturers. So the catcher acts as a nurturer to the pitcher. When a pitcher gets rattled, when he gets upset, it's the catcher who goes to the mound to calm him down. Yeah, cancer and the moon are also embodied in the fans. The emotional tendencies of, of the fan base are embodiments of the moon in a team's birth chart. I'm gonna talk more about this when I get to talking about the giants. And here's a picture of a crab, it's pretty, you know, they move sideways, you know, with these, here it is, you know, with, it, with its, it, with its shell-like ornamentation, kind of looks a lot like Buster Posey here, kind of moving sideways, crab, crab kind of does the same thing. But Leo and the right feet and the sun correspond to the right fielder. Usually right field is the sunniest part of the baseball field. That's usually the way they're lined out, they're, that a baseball diamond is laid out. And right fielders, they have sunny personalities. They're like Leo's right fielders, they love attention. They have that star quality that you know lets them bask in adoration. Right fielders are not shy. They're like the biggest showboats, the ones who love the attention. Here's a picture from across the bay, Reggie Jackson when he used to play for Oakland. Right fielder, very much showboat hot dog personality. This is what you get in right field. Now, the sign of Virgo and the planet Mercury also correspond to the pitcher like Gemini does. So they're Vir Virgo pitchers and they're Gemini pitchers. And there are, there are many that are both since Mercury rules over both signs, Mercury, both signs, Gemini and Virgo. Um, the difference is that a Gemini pitcher is more likely to try to overpower a batter with speed, whereas a Virgo pitcher is more concerned with his control and with precise placement of his pitches. You know, Virgo pitcher, Virgo pitcher is also more likely to take advantage of all the analytical data at hand, you know, um, about the batter's tendencies since uh, Virgo rules the analytical part of the brain. Now, Libra and the planet Venus correspond to the second baseman. So the symbol of Libra is a scale. And Libras are good at things that require balance. And a second baseman needs really good balance. The quintessential act of a second baseman is performing the double play. When a second baseman is able to turn the double play with a runner running right at him, trying to mess up his throw to first, uh, what he does is he leaps straight into the air you know, and he, you know, to avoid the runner, avoid getting knocked over. But still, with his feet off the ground, he's still able to make that throw. Um, to be able to do that with your feet off the ground, this, is, this requires a really refined sense of equilibrium, which Libras and second basemen are known for. Now, Scorpio and the planet Pluto correspond to the third baseman. So the ball gets hit to the third baseman really quickly and with a tremendous amount of force. You know, it, get, it gets there faster than it does with the shortstop or to the second baseman since he's closer to the batter. Now, especially if there's a right-handed pull hitter um, at bat. And the third baseman doesn't have a lot of area, a lot of ground to cover, but he has to react very quickly because the speed of the ball is passing through his territory. So a Scorpio is a fixed sign and he's third baseman and the Scorpio, they're still, 
yet, yet they're poised, alert, and waiting. They're concentrating. This, this is what the third baseman does. The third baseman is still, but he's ready. And he has to have quick reactions. And the quick reactions of the third baseman originate from that intense concentration for which Scorpios are known for. I mean, he, one gets in position to receive the impact of the batted ball and then just, you know, and, and be able to receive it and then throw it back instantly, just hold it, absorb it, and then, and then chuck it back. So Scorpio is a highly pressurized water sign. It's able to receive the ball and rapidly return it back, firing it to first, putting out the runner. It's a lot like the act of revenge. You know, Scorpios are known for revenge. It's like the person who waits for somebody to begin, begin a fight so they can finish it. You just absorb the punch and then throw it right back and you're, you win. Okay, the sign of Sagittarius and the planet Jupiter correspond to the batter. You know, think like an archer, the symbol of Sagittarius, you know, pulling a bow to shoot an arrow. You know, the batter swings at the ball. You know, the centaur shoots an arrow, but symbolically what's going on here, this is an aspiration. You know, the, 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 the centaur and the batter are both aiming for a star. You're aiming, aspiring to hit the ball somewhere lucky hit it in an auspicious place. So there's hope and optimism. The hope and optimism of the science Sagittarius and the planet Jupiter are there. They're present at the batter with every swing. You know, the batter's teammates and fans, they're there with them at every at bat, hoping every swing is gonna prove fortunate and lead to a run, lead to a rally. So this is Sagittarius and Jupiter embodied in the batter. Capricorn and the planet Saturn correspond to the manager. So the sign of Capricorn and the planet Saturn, they, they of course, they, they agree the qualities of age, wisdom, and decisiveness. Capricorns, you know, correspond to the man. The manager makes the decisions. He sets the lineup, makes the pitching changes, calls for the pinch hitters. And managers, they have both the positive and negative qualities of Saturn and Capricorn. They could be the wise father figure, the sage who guides the players with his wisdom and his experience and give them their advice. But they can also be the out of touch tyrant, the person who just gets in the way of everybody's fun, gets in the way of their development, the old fart who just calls the shots, but is totally out of touch with everybody else. So, you know, Saturn, Capricorn, manager. Aquarius and, and the planet Uranus correspond with the left fielder. Here's a picture of Barry Bonds, who has the moon in Aquarius. I'm gonna talk at length about Barry in a little while. So the mind of an Aquarius strives to be, to be objective and detached. And Aquarius is the sign most able to see the big picture. You know, the left fielder needs this ability to track the trajectory of the ball in flight. Ball coming to this field, I mean, they're a left fielder is able to have the capacity to sense the air currents affecting the flight of the ball. You know, the skill to pursue and catch a ball, it's similar to that, like an air traffic controller, guide, you know, guiding the ball in into his glove, observing the observing the big picture, no, seeing the whole sky. This is very Aquarian. It's like the, you know, the Aquarian profession of air traffic controller of air pilot. They've got to have a sense of the big sky, seeing everything that's going on in it. So Aquarius and Uranus also correspond to the home run. So the arc of a home run, you know, ball hit a long distance and over the fence. This has the Aquarian quality of air travel. Um, and like the sign Aquarius, the home run, it's fixed and solid. It's high and all encompassing. You know, and it's also individualistic. It's like Aquarians are individuals. They like to do things by themselves. And a batter who completes a home run, he doesn't need the help of his teammates to reach home. This is like the individualism that's embodied in Aquarius. Uh, Babe Ruth had the son in Aquarius. Uh, so did Hank Aaron. Um, Barry Bonds had the moon in Aquarius, and I've talked a little talk about later. Okay, so the sign of Pisces and the planet Neptune correspond with the first baseman. Pisces is a receptive water sign. A Pisces absorbs emotional and psychic vibrations. And similar to that, a first baseman's primary function is to receive and absorb, you know, to receive and absorb the throws from the other infielders. And these throws can be all over the place. Um, if they're errant throws, they'll skid in the dirt, they'll fly over one's head or the straight of the side. But the fisherman, it's like the first baseman, he's like a fisherman with a large net and he's ready to catch all manner of these throws. I'll show you something here. 
So the symbol of Pisces is a fish we've got here. And the thing is what's unique about a fish is they have gills. Uh, only fish have gills. And this is the first baseman's mitt. It has an odd resemblance to a fish gill. This is just kind of an interesting way how the archetype of Pisces has manifested itself in the first baseman's glove. So there are teams. Now on to teams. Excuse me. This is not a product placement, sorry. Um, there are 30 major league baseball teams currently playing in the United States. And each of them has an astrological birth chart that shows their strengths, weaknesses, and tendencies at each of these positions that I just outlined. And these birth charts also reveal a lot about the characters and tendencies of the teams as a whole. I'm gonna talk about the Giants, but if you're interested in any other, the any, if you follow any of the other teams, or if you're just curious about the whole picture, get my book because I've got a chapter on every single one of these 30 teams and each of them is fascinating. It has its own culture, its own lore, its own tragedies, its own triumphs. Um, there are just amazing stories to each of these teams. So the Giants, our hometown team, they were born in New York on December 7th, 1882 at 1 36 p.m. You can ask me later how I got that birth time. This is a photo of the Giants team that took the field in 1883. Um, this is Roger Connor here in the corner who I'm going to talk about later. He was first baseman for this team. And here is the birth chart of the team as for New York where they lived until 1958. First thing that stands out that I want to talk about in this birth chart, which is highly unusual, is this concentration of, oops, sorry, is this concentration of planets here in the sign of Sagittarius. The giants have Mercury, Venus, Sun, and Mars all in Sagittarius. This is highly unusual that four planets were aligned up in the sky in the same sign. Uh, just within six degrees of each other when the giants were born. And this is the sign of the batter. Um, so the giants have been traditionally a, a team of strong bats, of strong offense. That's been a, a big emphasis on their team. Another, another thing that I want to point out here in the aspect of the charts is this, the ruling planet of the sign Sagittarius is Jupiter. And it is in a square aspect to Uranus. Jupiter's at 27 Gemini, Uranus is at 23 Virgo, and these planets are in square. So there's this dynamic energy go exchange going on between the planet Jupiter and the planet Uranus. And when is the, you know, Uranus rolls home runs, Jupiter rolls uh, batters in general. But I'm going to talk about more of that later when we get to San Francisco. So look at this, this is the plan, this is the sign for Sagittarius. Um, the symbol for Sagittarius is a centaur. This is a mythological creature, half horse, half human being, which is also an archer, has a bow and arrow, is aiming for a star, it's symbolic of aspiration, going higher, transforming from animal nature to human nature, and then going on even higher into the stars and some divine realms and shooting for a star. So take a look at this, this is the symbol now. This is a statue that showed up across the street from Oracle Park on this building. It is also of a centaur. Um, however, instead of holding a bow and arrow, it is actually holding a bat. So this, this is in the realm of you can't make this stuff up. Uh, an artist got, a, you know, somehow feeling the vibe of Sagittarius and the batter and put it in the statue right across the street from AT and from, well, it's now called Oracle Park, um, you know, the building that went up there. Um, so here's his bat. Here's his horse body, here's his torso of a human. Um, here's someone else on his team who is obviously female and has a glove and is about to catch this ball. Um, so anyways, next time you're at the ballpark, take a look at this. It is uncanny that the symbol of Sagittarius, the sun, you know, which is this you know, major energy of the giants is manifest in the statue right across the street from the ballpark. 
I'm gonna go back in time a little ways. This is the polo grounds in New York where the Giants played for many years before moving to San Francisco. Interesting is its name, that it's called the polo grounds because polo wasn't really played there. Polo is a Sagittarian game played on horseback, um, probably by rich gentlemen who own horses. But regardless of that, we're not talking about, this isn't a class analysis here, we're talking about symbols and archetypes and how they're manifest here. Polo, the, the, the polo grounds, um, from what I understand, there were three different versions of it from like perhaps 1880s on forward to 1950, times of this park was torn down and rebuilt two times or three times, but only in the first incarnation of the park was polo actually played. Yet they'd rebuilt the park and they kept the name of the polo grounds. You wonder, well, why call it the polo grounds? We're not playing polo. Well, keep the name polo because it's a horse. It associates with horse. It associates with the, the Sagittarian energy of the giants is manifest in that name, the polo grounds. So the other fascinating thing about this park that I can see is the shape of it. It interestingly has this kind of half circle here. It goes all the way around and outfield is kind of like a straight line. This oddly resembles a horseshoe. So that's another horse symbol manifest here in a stadium of the giants, you know, as far as the giants, the giants territory. So let me go on. This is a picture of Roger Connor. Let me tell you about him. So Sagittarius is the sign of the batter and the sign of offense. Excuse me, I think it is. Um, so the Giants have been a team of strong hitters, you know, from early on. We know about Bobby Bonds here, and we know about Willie Mays. We know about Willie McCovey growing, growing up in San Francisco, following the Giants. But back to New York, there were some amazing hitters, some amazing manifestations of this Sagittarian energy in this team. And this is, I want to talk about Roger Connor. This is a man who set the record for the most home runs in the 19th century. Um, he had 137 home runs in his lifetime. And for quite a while, he was the one who held the record for the most home runs. Um, you asked, well, which, if there were a trivia question, well, who's the other giant who held the record for most major league home runs? Roger Connor. He was the one who first, you had it for many years until it was broken by Babe Ruth. And Roger Connor was also big. For his age, he was, he was, a big guy. He was six foot three, 220 pounds. And because of his size, this is the reason the team is called the Giants. Before him and before people recognize his size, his size the team was called the Gothams, the New York Gothams. Um, he was the original giant um, for which the team was named. Um, he played first base. He was also a manager. So this is Roger Connor. He's part of our heritage. And this is Bill Terry, the last National League player to bat over 400. Um, Giant, you know, one of the great giants. I believe his number used to be really prominent when, or his name when he'd go to Candlestick Park. It's a Terry. I believe, I forgot what his number is, but I'm sure I can be reminded. This is Mel Ott. He held the National League record for home runs for many years for 511. And John McGraw. I'm going to talk about John McGraw for a while. Um, he managed the Giants for 30 years, from 1902 to 1932. So for many years, he was the face of the Giants franchise. When one thought of the Giants, one thought of McGraw, because he had been the manager for so long. Actually, hold the reins as the manager for 30 years, start off as a player manager, and then, you know, started as a young man, and then, okay, the, sure, 30 years is going to age anybody, but 30 years, being a baseball manager, you're going to it's going to take its toll. But I want to show the resonance between him and the Giants' birth chart and why it was he became the face of the franchise. So here's the Giants' birth chart in New York. The rising sign the face they show to the world is in Aries. Um, it also has Saturn and the South Node in the first house. And here's a chart of John McGraw. His son is in Aries, his Mercury is in Aries, and they are very close to the same degree as the giant's ascendant. So the face of the giants, well, are the, you know, John McGraw's son and 
and Mercury energy were become superimposed on the ascendant of the giants, on the face of the giants right there. Um, the other thing that's going on is the giants have Saturn in the first house. That's the first planets in the first house will also be visible to everyone. So Saturn, Saturn corresponds to manager. You've got Saturn in the first house. So you've got a very outgoing manager that everybody can see. And then look at John McGraw's planets in Taurus that are in the same degree or very close to the giant Saturn. You've got Pluto pretty close to 20 degrees Taurus and Venus, 22 and a half degrees Taurus, superimposes on the giants Saturn. And you've got a manager right there where everybody can see who's belligerent in everybody's faces, always abusing the umpire, aggressive. Um, John McGraw was like that, the giants were like that. The, the giants in New York had Aries rising and not to knock people that are Aries rising, but it brings an energy of assertiveness bordering on aggression, but back in those days, it probably was more aggression than assertion as this is a team that got in a lot of fights and their ringleader was the manager, was John McGraw. You know, because of that Saturn in the first house and that Aries rising, his, his Aries sun and Mercury right there conjunct the giants ascendant. So John McGraw, he's part of our heritage too. You know, we now have a kinder, gentler style to our giants, but they're there in our heritage. Another thing I wanna talk about in the giants chart is the moon. We have the moon in Scorpio. And a moon in Scorpio is like deep, soulful emotions, deep and in, in intense passions, intense, intense emotions that can be destructive, that can go astray, that can, that can just lead to some lashing out and some self-destruction of you know, one's friends, one's family, one's partners, or oneself. Um, moon and Scorpio can doom someone to just so, to destructive behavior. If they can't find a way to channel these passions, it's a very passionate moon, but it needs, it, 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 it could benefit from some containment. So what's interesting in the giant's chart is right opposite is Saturn in Taurus, you know, which represents the manager, which represents father figures, which, which brings some containment to all this passionate energy. So I want to, emphasize this point because it's like I've got the moon corresponds to the catcher but also corresponds to the team as the whole the team as a collective unit but also the fan base so what you've got going on here is you've got Saturn providing not just a man not just being a manager but also being a father figure who's able to contain this the scorpionic energy and give it direction give it a place so there's a faint, when John McGraw died sometime in the 1930s, there was a really good quote from Haywood Braun as a sports columnist, what he said about McGraw and his leadership. He said, an important part of McGraw's capacity for leadership was that he could take kids out of the wheat fields and coal mines and make them walk and talk and chatter and play ball with the look of eagles. So in astrological symbolism, the eagle is an exaltation of the scorpion. You know, when a Scorpio becomes refined and transforms its energy, you know, this lowly bug that crawls in dark places, you know, ascends and becomes an eagle. It was a magnificent creature with the power of flight. So Scorpio has that ability to just transform itself given the right circumstances. So this is what we have going on with the giants. And I'm relating it not just to the players as a team, not just to these kids in the wheat fields and coal mines, but also to the fan base. Here's a picture of that team, of one of the teams, um, one of their championship teams from that era. This is in 1921. Wish I can't really make this bigger, but just look at these boys. You can see it, folks. You can see the coal mines. You can see the wheat fields in them, but you can also see the eagle the look of eagles in these in, in these boys in this team you can you can feel the transformation that takes place within there so this is the look of eagles and i want to add that it's not just about the 
players. It's about the fan base. There's a, hold on, I've got a, I've got noise up on them. Okay, it's not just about the players. The fan base has this experience also. You know, Giants fans, it's like we've got that, we've got that passion, that scorpionic intensity, but we need a place for it. And it's like this is what this team has allowed for us, giving us a given us a venue, giving us a place to transform that scorpionic passion, you know, into the look of eagles, you know, something like that. So, all right. Take that for what it's worth, but this is this is this is part of the experience of being a Giants fan, you know, transforming from a lowly scorpionic creature, you know, into an eagle. You know, there, of course, there there have been some miserable seasons that we've endured. You know, there have been some miserable experiences, but we're we're able to transform it. We've got all that passion, and we've been able to fly, and we can like feel it, feel that passion, feel that Scorpio passion, feel feel that transformative effect. You know, turning into an eagle, power to flight. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox. All right, we're coming to San Francisco now. I'm leaving New York. So the, the Giants moved to San Francisco in 1958. Here's the parade when they arrived or soon after they arrived down Montgomery Street. Here is Willie Mays. I'm not sure who the player is next to him, but uh, this is pretty celebratory. Uh, I can just think of that song, when the giants come to town, it's bye bye baby. And here is their birth chart. So when a team or a person moves to a new location, there's a new birth chart cast for their new home. And oftentimes what happens is the ascendant changes when someone moves and the houses, the planets will move to different houses. I won't go into like the house placements as much, but I do wanna talk about the ascendant. So in New York, the rising sign was Aries. Um, here in San Francisco, the rising sign is now Aquarius. So this is very important because it's in, in keeping with um, the values of San Francisco, the spirit of San Francisco. I'm gonna talk about this in a little while. So. Aquarius. Aquarius is the sign of the human being. You know, the human being is a flawed creature with so many aspirations, so many dreams. It's a creature that strives for betterment, you know, that strives to get along, that strives to embrace other people despite their differences. And the human being is also a creature that invents things. So Aquarius, right, our new rising sign, the sign of the human being. But it's more than that. The rising sign Aquarius also corresponds to the giants, the giants in Greek mythology. Um, this, the, in Greek mythology, the giants were a divine race. Um, they were friends to the Titans. They were not the same as the Titans. They're different from the Titans that are different from the gods of Olympus. But, but more interesting, most interesting for our purposes that they were a, they were rebels. They were the ones trying to overthrow the established order of the gods of Olympus. So. This archetype of the giant transformed. In New York, it's like, think of Roger Connor as, you know, the big person, it meant a big, large person. Now in San Francisco, this archetype of giant has changed to a rebel, you know, to be in keeping with the spirit of our city. There's, there's this subtext, or you know, not even a subtext, a text of trying to overthrow the establishment that is part of San Francisco lore and part of the, part of the heritage of the giants. So two things here, you know, the strivings of humanity to get along, strivings of humanity to get along and the rebelliousness of giants. So think of San Francisco as one of the great things we've done here is we're the birthplace of the United Nations. And this is the United Nations is very much an Aquarian endeavor. You know, it's an effort to get the nations of the world to agree with each other. And it was born here in San Francisco. So here we're, we, were the, we're, we were the midwives to this project. This is very much an Aquarian project. It's keeping with the giants Aquarius ascendant. We also have pride. And this is just one of the many cultures that um, this 
dismissed or denigrated in other parts of the world, other parts of the country. We've embraced the LGBTQ community, community, and so have the Giants. The Giants are the first team to actually start re to recognize this community. It was in 1994, they did the first Until There's a Cure event. This was back before that was considered acceptable. Not that it's considered acceptable now, it, and, you know, with all teams, I'm not, I haven't kept the pulse on all that, who actually has pride events across the country, but it's, it's not unheard of for um, baseball teams and other sports teams to do this kind of thing. There was recently a, a NFL player who came out of the closet. It's, you know, for a football player to come out of the closet is rather, that's quite a milestone, but the Giants led the way with this kind of thing. Um, you no, know, they, did this back in 1994, long before that was common. Uh, the Giants are also the first team to sign multitudes of Latinx players. They were the first team to scout the Dominican Republic. Um, this is um, Maddie Felipe and Jesus Alou, uh, who are brothers from the Dominican Republic, who all, all were scouted by the Giants, all played by the, played for the Giants. Uh, Felipe was a manager here as well. So this is part of our heritage, the Alou brothers, and part of the legacy of the Giants is bringing in so many Latinx players into baseball. It was the Giants who got that going. And here's a picture of Masanori Murakami. This is the first Japanese player signed to a major league contract. Um, the Giants did this in 1964. And you think about this, 1964, I believe, if my math is correct, that's just how many, what's that, 21 years after the end of the war um, was Japan that the Giants were daring enough, willing enough to do this, to sign a Japanese player. So the Giants have broken ground and they very much reflect San Francisco, San Francisco's ability to accept other races, other cultures, other lifestyles. The Giants very much reflect our city that way. They have been doing this for, you know, you know, probably, you know, I want to almost want to say as long as they've been here. Okay, so I'm going to talk about Barry Bonds. Barry Bonds broke Hank Aaron's record in, I believe it was 2007. And there's a lot to say about Barry and his connections with the Giants. So Barry was our face of the franchise for many years. Uh, not as long as McGraw was the face of the, the New York franchise, but from the time he was signed in 1993 to the time he um, left in 2007, you could say Barry Bonds was the face of the franchise. So how did this happen? What's his resonance with the Giants? Well, Giants ascendant is right here, five degrees Aquarius. Here's Barry's moon three degrees Aquarius. I don't have the exact time of his chart and the moon can move several degrees during the course of a day. So it's quite possible that it's, um, this is off by a few degrees, but chances, but, but this is uncanny that it's so close to the giant's ascendant. So, and it's also interesting that it's this moon, that there's sort of like this moon lunar connection with Barry, that it was like his home was with the Giants, the moon corresponding with the home. His father, um, Bobby Bonds, had played for the Giants, and of course his godfather is Willie Mays. So he had this, he had this family connection with the team. You know, out of out of, you know, he first signed with the Pittsburgh Pirates, and he became a free agent. And we, you know, the Giants were able to sign him in '93 during that year where the Giants almost moved to Tampa Bay, and then they were bought by. Um, the new ownership that kept the team here. Part of that was was bringing, signing Bobby Bonds. All this happened, I believe it was, yeah, 1993, could have been 92. But anyways, um, so this is his connection with, this is how he became the face of the franchise. But there's more going on than that. Um, Barry Bonds, of course, had his downfall. Um, we know about his use of steroids while he was in pursuit of Hank Aaron's record. But this whole the steroid thing was not all about Barry. I mean, there were other, of course, there were other players taking steroids, and uh, there were probably other players on the heels of Hank Aaron's record. But interesting that it ended up 
being Barry who broke the record and he broke it in San Francisco under this cloud. So San Francisco becomes ground zero for the steroid scandal, baseball steroid scandal. And Bobby Bonds becomes persona non grata across the nation. And we still appreciated him here, but he's the post became the poster boy for steroid abuse. And you figure, well, why did this happen? What in his karma, his, his birth chart, the giant's birth chart, what, why did this happen here? Well, there's a very interesting explanation. So here's the giant's birth chart in San Francisco. I pointed this out earlier, the square between the planet Jupiter and the planet Uranus. So Jupiter is the planet of the batter, of aspirations, hopes, and dreams, of, of doing what you can, wanting things. And then Uranus, Uranus has, is a planet of home runs, of air travel and home runs, but there's more going on here. Um, you place these two energies in a square. Squares can be problematic. They're very powerful, but they can lead to problems. So think of Uranus. The, the energy of Uranus is it's a Promethean energy. It invents things. It brings new technologies like air travel, like computers, and well, like steroids. And Uranus is also a liberator. You know, it brings fire and it doesn't like to follow rules. You know, Uranus can be a libertine. And this was a setup for Barry Bonds in, in San Francisco's birth chart, is the, you know, when you take the ex Jupiter, can, Jupiter can be too much. It's like, you know, Sagittarian characters, they're, they're just, they're, you know, they're, they're bigger than life. They're very boisterous. You just wanna, sometimes you just wanna tell them, hey, hey, calm down and get real, but they're just so excitable. And so they just can't stop. Well, you take that energy, you combine it with like the libertine quality of Prometheus, and it's just it's it's just growing too big, and it it doesn't it doesn't have any respect for rules, and it's like okay, yeah, we've just discovered these steroids, we're gonna pump ourselves up, and we're gonna hit all these home runs, and it's gonna be great. Never mind the consequences; we don't even need to think about that. So this is what's going on. You combine these two energies. You're on, you know. You know the technological advances, the the you know the genius of Uranus with the expansiveness of Jupiter. You've got you've got a setup for steroid abuse. And here's Barry's Barry Bonds's birth chart. What set him up is he's got this conjunction in this chart between Venus and Mars at 23 and 25 Gemini. This is directly in line with this square in the Giant's birth chart. So. Yes, he's the hometown boy, had a connection with the giants on this level. But here, his own astrological energy is right in line with this square um, of Uranus and Jupiter energy that led to the abuse. So, so Barry ended up breaking Hank Aaron's record. Um, we're proud of him, or maybe we're not, but this is this is part of the story. This is part of the story, you know, the astrological setup that he was under. So enough about Barry. Let's talk about Willie Mays, is Barry Bonds's godfather. Um, I like to think of Willie Mays as the most loved of giants. Um, he just has this aura like no other giant in San Francisco, perhaps no other giant in New York as well. Um, son, his son is in Taurus, so he's a natural center fielder. Let me show you his birth chart and his connection with the giants. Um, here is his son in Taurus, which makes him a natural center fielder. You know, some people say he made the greatest catch ever. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna go there and argue about that one. But what I find fascinating is connection with the chart of the giants is because his son at 15 Taurus is exactly conjunct the giants Neptune. So he's able to pull out the Neptunian energy of the giants chart. So Neptune, so it's, this is a kind of spiritual energy, a spiritual vibe that, that Willie Mays is able to tap. Um, he, so he's the one who's able to bring this love out of us as Giants fans by tapping this Neptunian energy. And this is like a love that transcends differences, transcends differences of culture, transcends differences of 
race and nationality. And it's not, it's not an erotic love or a filial love. It's a love that brings people together on a spiritual plane. And it's different from like the, the, the Aquarius energy of bringing people together. You know, the Aquarius energy is more like a mental argument why people should get along, why people are equal, and why it's necessary, why it's mentally necessary for us to just sort of join together as humanity. And it's this ideal, but it's not really feeling it, where it's like this Neptune energy is, is the spiritual and emotional glue that binds people together. And Willie Mays is the player that gives us that as Giants fans. And it's their, it's their present, you know, because his son at 15 Taurus is conjunct the Giants Neptune. So he pulls out that Neptune energy. So that's why he's, you know, I say he's the most beloved of Giants. So that's a, there's a picture of Willie Mays playing stickball with the kids in New York. You know, they loved him there too. That's why he, then his last year after the Giants traded him, he played one year with the Mets before he hung it up. And so speaking of hanging it up, I think that is my, that concludes my talk. So bye bye baby, as Russ Hodges used to say, and you know, don't stop believing. Uh, thank you very much for um, listening to my talk. I'm gonna stop sharing the screen and give it back to SFPL and John, thanks. Thank you, Sather. That was a fascinating talk. Uh, felt like I learned a lot. I didn't know about the Giants, both in their New York phase and more recent. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, if if uh, audience members have questions for the author, please go ahead and put them in the chat. Uh, we have a few minutes. If you don't mind, uh, maybe Sather, I'll, I'll ask you a few questions to start things. Um, um, please do, I'm getting, okay. I've, got a, I've got to close some stuff on the, some, my computer is starting to scan, but there I, I stopped it, okay. Okay, well, I, I know you've been um, involved with baseball and astrology for some time. I'm just curious, when did you first um, get inspired? Or when did you first know that you wanted to write a book uh, that combines these two passions, baseball and astrology? Well, it, I, I kind of got it. The way I got into the giants in astrology, what happened was this was early nineties and I was at the SFPL and I had, it was one winter and I was looking for a birth date for the 49ers because my, I was thinking, I noticed the 49ers were playing terrible and I was thinking, Hmm. And there's a mercury retrograde was going on at that time. I thought, well, maybe the 49ers have some sort of mercury thing going on. If I can get their birth chart, that's I could explain that they're playing terrible because it's mercury retrograde. But I couldn't find a book on the 49ers that had a date of birth. But I did find a book on the Giants and I found their birth date. I thought, whoa, I got to plug this in and see what I can find. And it was just like, oh my God, this is like something's going on here. This is, this is, this is fascinating. And yeah, it just, it's just, you know, went into the rabbit hole and haven't gotten out since. Wow, thank you. Um, I have a question about astrology. So astrology seems to be uh, gaining more and more popularity these days. And I'll mention SFPL has almost 2000 titles, uh, astrology titles. Still, you know, many people are not familiar with astrology, certainly not on the deep level that you are. Uh, how would you suggest that one approach astrology? Well, I think probably go to the San Francisco Public Library, find a book that, that agrees with you because they're written in all kinds of different styles. Some are pretentious, some are very basic, some are in the middle. You have to find one that you vibe with. Um, there's, I mostly do Western astrology, but there's various forms of astrology from various cultures. Um, there's a lot of native cultures use versions of astrology. There's, of course, Chinese astrology, um, um, Vedic astrology. You can, I suggest that you tap into your own culture, your own heritage, and find out what's the astrological tradition there. 
Great answer. Thanks for plugging the library too. <laughs> uh, we have a question from the audience. When did you become interested in astrology? Oh God, you know, I'm, there's that line in, um, I think it's a book of uh, William Faulkner wrote this book. Um, I think it's called The Bear, where he says he, the line is, so he should have hated and feared the bear or something because the bear symbolized that, you know, the destruction of the wilderness changing his life. So, something, maybe it wasn't a bear, it was something like that. So that was me. So he should have hated and feared astrology. And I did hate and fear astrology for, for most of my life. But I met this person named Jake at Cafe Commons on Mission Street way back when. And it was part of a discussion group. And I did not, I, I told, he, he said he was an astrologer and I did not, I, I basically told him I did not like astrology and I thought it was stupid. And he, he, he just kind of shrugged, but, 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 I, but I liked him. So I continued being friends with him in spite of me totally despising what he was into. And somehow I just kind of warmed up to it, just sort of through him. Thanks. That's interesting. Because um, I was living in the mission probably the same time you were. Uh, we have another question from the audience. What happens if a player does not share the sun sign of his position, i.e. a shortstop is a Sagittarius? Okay, I would, well, a couple of things could be going on. Say a short, we're just looking at the sun sign. It's like say Buster, I'm sorry, Brandon Crawford has Mars in Aries. So, but he doesn't, I, I can't recall where his sun was, but I was looking at his chart yesterday preparing for this talk. Cause I mean, well, Brandon Crawford's having a good year and he's a shortstop, never looked at his chart. His Mars is in a, is an area. So that makes him a natural shortstop. But there are players that are, that you look at their birth chart and think, well, this person probably should not have been playing that position. His natural position was something else. He was just, you know, the coach or his dad said, oh, you're, this is, this, this was the position I play, so I want you to play it. Or, you know, it's like people get thrown into, people take, People take the wrong major, people end up in the wrong profession. It happens on the ball field too. You know, the natural position is something other than what they're doing. Thanks. A um, couple more audience questions. Uh, one, how did you rectify birth times of SF giants? Awesome talk. Um, is that, okay, I, I think I saw a flash for that. Is that Andrea? Andrea? Yes. Hey, Andrea, so glad you're here. I, I'll give you the rectification notes. I think you have a copy of my book. Um, uh, look in the footnotes for that. I've got a footnote explaining the rectification of the giant's chart. Um, so it's, it, for those of you who don't know this, it's like, it's like reverse engineering. You can kind of like figure out a time of birth of a chart by, by, you know, by using, you know, these various, um, astrological progressions or looking at transits to, to certain parts of the chart at certain times, certain important points of their history. And you can kind of jimmy it, walk it back. It's not an exact science, it's an art, but, but I think I got this one right. 1.36 PM for the giants. Those so are, Andrea, uh, we've, we've got sorry. to talk soon, Andrea. Another audience member, uh, David Booth, says, wonderful presentation, Cesar. Did anything surprise you in your writing and interpreting of the team's charts? Um, I think past a certain point, um, when you're like in a rabbit hole, everything's a surprise. Everything's just everything is like, wow, whoa, whoa. Everything is just mind blowing. So it's kind of like you're back to the point where you're just, ex are you surprised when you're expecting to be surprised? It's almost like a philosophical conundrum. I, I think they got to a point where like, okay, if you're just sort of blown, you're constantly amazed by things. Is that, is that a state of a surprise or does that just become like just a constant state of wonder about life and things? So, so says our answer is yes. Okay, I got a couple of questions for you. Um, we all know that there's rivalries between sports teams, such as, for example, the rivalry between the Giants and the Dodgers. Uh, can these be explained by astrology? Um, yes and no. I I was looking at the at the Dodgers chart earlier today, just anticipating this talk, and I, I it's it's almost like you look at their chart. Their chart is more like 
annoying to us as dot as giants fans and ours is to theirs i mean their saturn is 12 aquarius which is square our moon so they're there to it's just they're frustrating our 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 impulses as fans and they're I believe their their pluto is at 20 degrees taurus which is conjunct our saturn so and there's just there's it's a bad mix of energy but i wouldn't but so that's there. Also, I could, you know, looks like we're out of time, but you know, if we could look up the look up the chart of like the other famous rivalry, the Red Sox and the Yankees, there's there's some interesting stuff there in terms of like the aspects of these teams sort of being somewhat in opposition. But oftentimes these teams are born in in pairs, somewhat sort of in opposites. You look like, you know, a team like the Cubs and the Reds, the first two professional teams. The Cubs' son is in. I'm sorry. The the Reds' son is in Virgo, and the and then the Cubs were born like a couple of years later, and their son is at the exact opposite end of the of the zodiac wheel in Pisces. So these teams form these dialectics, but that's not necessarily translate as rivalries, but. Um, that does deserve a deeper look. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to say, yeah, I was going to ask you about uh, one other thing about these important struggles for social justice uh, that have um, periodically manifested in baseball. I, I felt like your talk touched on that. Did you want to say anything more along those lines? Um, that's okay. It looks like we're we're running out of time, but it's fascinating if you look at say I. I've got on YouTube a presentation I did recently about the Atlanta Braves and about Hank Aaron breaking Babe Ruth's record. Um, generally, it's the energy of Uranus. Here it was in the Giants kind of like leading to Barry Bonds and steroid use. Unfortunately, that's too much of the part. That's, that doesn't tell the full story of Uranus, the Promethean energy, because Uranus is a liberator and it breaks things. So it's there in a lot of this, the issues of social justice. But at the same time, you have to have Saturn is also a force because it's one thing to just tear everything down and deliberate, but then you've got to, you have to come up with a new structure that contains the new order. And that's the energy of Saturn. Now that's like, I'm not a Braves fan, but their history is fascinating. It's got a lot of tearing down and breaking, you know, tearing down old orders and then reestablishing things. And they're, they're still struggling with that. Well, thank you for a fascinating presentation. And thank you also for uh, giving us your time to answer a few questions. Uh, just remind the audience that our library carries uh, Cesar's poetry, as well as uh, we have many copies of the baseball book on order. They haven't arrived yet, but they will soon. Um, and beyond that, uh, I just want to wish everyone a pleasant evening. Thank you also to our YouTube viewers and to my colleague, Lisa Weddle. Um, thanks, everyone, and I wish you a pleasant evening. Yeah, and if you anyone wants to contact me, my email address is um, baseballastrology at outlook.com. You know, I look forward to your emails. I'll and put that one last time in the uh, chat, baseballastrology.com. Wow, this Over. is cool. I didn't get a chance to read all this stuff in here. Wow, thank you everybody for attending. And yes, the, comp the compliments are coming in. Thanks everyone. Good night from us at SFBL. Thank you, says our love. All right, thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.